the line that I needed him to say was, my name is not Cottonmouth. But every time he did it, he was just like, my name's not Cottonmouth. I ain't no joke. I used to let the mic smoke. The bulletproof black man. For the hard rocks, he's a ghetto boogeyman of their nightmares. You can get a smack for this. Really, guys? You gotta know we tried, man. I ain't no joke. Joke. But one man cannot save a community. You can't keep doing what you're doing. I have no idea what you're talking about. And believe me, Luke Cage is nothing but a man. Chael, this, you are the epitome of my, my dream. A oh, journalist? No, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. I'm gonna start I mean, off well, the hard stuff. Well, I mean, you know, it's epitome I, of my dream. <laughs> well, 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 then, I mean, it's like, man, it's like either dream high or I, I must be a huge disappointment. Nah, nah, nah. You went from the from being a journalist to seeing your vision to be able to put it on film. And I, I always dream of it, like I watch all these films, all this stuff. So I wonder, like, when you were, were in those journalist shoes, what was the toughest question you ever had to ask as a journalist? Ah, uh, well, my technique as an interviewer is that I would spend all day with somebody, say like I was with Big, like, you know, if I was around Biggie and I was gonna ask him questions about selling drugs or about, you know, friends of his that, that died. My technique was always to just talk about the music and talk about everything else and then with the final questions, once someone's comfortable, then you go in for the kill. Because sometimes you, your entire interview might only be about one question, but sometimes you have to ask 35 questions in order to create the world for this one question. Um, and it's a lesson that I learned the thing is, is that every single lesson that I learned as a journalist reflects directly back on how I run the show. Um, because honestly, I see the show as being like a big magazine, and I'm just the editor-in-chief of the magazine. You know, and as an editor-in-chief, you're a part of every single story, but each individual writer with their byline, that's their story. And so it's a combination of having an overall vision for the show, but at the same time allowing, you know, the Aida Krolls and the Kayla Coopers and the Charles Murrays um, and the Nathan Jacksons and, you know, um, the Matt Owens and the Matt Loses um, and, um, you know, everybody that is just, you know, coming with their different vision to, to do that, yeah. you know. Um, thing is, is that um, there was one time on set with Mahershala um, and we were on the roof, it was episode two of last season, and the line that I needed him to say was, my name is not Cottonmouth. But every time he did it, he was just like, my name's not Cottonmouth. He didn't, he didn't, he never really gave it like, like he does in the show. And I was like, I was just nervous and I was almost pushing it. And the director said, um, Paul McGagan said, relax, he's building up. I've seen actors do this. You just gotta just let it go. So that one, by the time he said, my name is not, like, it felt real yeah. and you just learn to just kind of like, you know, let something breathe because you will have time to get to the point that you're trying to get to. And, yeah. and that's really just the, the, the main thing. I've watched season two. There's a lot of stuff we can't talk about because fans haven't seen it yet. But I, I, I do want to say that y'all see Brooklyn. It was Harlem all last time. Mm -hmm. Now you see some Brooklyn and you deal with the, ling the lingo and everything. And it's sometimes hard to hear the patois of Jamaicans and everything, but you make it so that you can hear it. How difficult was that to weave this language in there, but make it palatable for like a wide audience? Well, that's the thing. Like we don't, we don't make anything palatable. It's just like, we just go for it. And people realize that, you, you know, if you think of everything as, as water, if you stop thrashing long enough to float, you're gonna be fine. And so rather than spoon feed or, you know, have somebody have the, um, the or, you know, a weakened Jamaican accent to make it easier for people that aren't used to the culture to understand, we just threw them off the deep end because that's what it's like when you're in Brooklyn. That's what it's like I when it, back in the 90s when I'd be at these hip hop parties and then all of a sudden they're playing tenor saw, they're playing super cat or they're playing, you know, um, Don Penn or, 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 or they're, they're playing, um, you know, um, Sister Nancy. Yeah. You just would hear these songs, and half the audience, because they, they you know, they they're from Jamaica or from, you know, or, or, or from Trinidad or, or wherever else, they're grooving, and you don't really quite understand the lyrics, but there's some power there. And the more that you listen to it, all of a sudden you like 
begin to understand the culture and the language and things slow down. I remember like first time I heard Shaba Ranks' roots and culture, I thought he was saying word him up. I didn't, it took me a long time <laughs> to realize I know my roots and culture, murderer. Like, yeah, like yeah. It, after a while, all of a sudden, when you make that shift and then you begin to understand um, what people are saying, then all of a sudden it has a much deeper meaning. Um, the same thing happened, of course, I mean, like, that's why I love, you know, the television show The Wire. Because when you watch The Wire for, for like the first three seasons, and then you go back and listen to some of those Wu-Tang records, all of a sudden the skits make complete sense. Because yeah. at first you're like, like, why, why, like, why is you know, Ghostface talking about his shoes and like, what, what's going on? And then you, you watch The Wire, you come back, oh, he's, they're, they're waiting for the re-up. You know, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, all of a sudden yeah. you, have, you have this much deeper understanding of, of the world that's being painted. But like the genius of Wu-Tang is like, they don't, they know that half the audience has never been to the projects and has no idea what they're talking about, but they're just creating a world. Yeah. And that's really what we try to do is create a world and then, you know, you bring people into it in a real way so that people from that world see it and recognize it and appreciate it as opposed to thinking that, oh, they're just gonna come in here and do some surface shit and leave. Yeah. You know? Just so we clear, I'm not in the market for a uh, sidekick. Who says you're not my sidekick? Me? It's my show.